Okay, Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, dear colleagues, uh, very good morning, afternoon, or even evening for quite a number of, of you, of course, depending on your time zone. And welcome to the fourth issue of the FAO in Geneva a Nutrition Dialogue Series, jointly organized with the Food and Nutrition Division in FAO headquarters and in collaboration with the Brussels Liaison Office and with a the significant technical contribution from the FAO's food system and food safety division. My name is Dominique Burgeon and I'm the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva and I will be moderating today's session. Before starting, uh, allow me to share the usual details regarding the logistics and the housekeeping for this virtual session. Uh, this webinar will be in English uh, with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will be later available on our website, along with the various related resources uh, relevant to this session. It is scheduled to last for about one hour and 30 minutes. Uh, we have reserved some time toward the end of the webinar for Q&A &A session, so please submit your question uh, using uh, the Q&A module, not the regular chat box, and we'll try our best to uh, accommodate as many requests as possible. Uh, please note that uh, a few uh, key terms and their definition will be shared in the chat uh, for your ease of reference. If you have any problem or technical issue, please send a message in the chat box uh, to ask for support. So that's all for uh, housekeeping, and I would now no, like to take a few moments to briefly introduce our speakers uh, today. Uh, we are actually honored and pleased to have with us uh, a number of distinguished speakers who will intervene on the topics of bringing food safety and nutrition together through an agri-food system approach. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Eleonora Dupuy, uh, food safety officer at FAO, uh, Dr. Stella North Hagen, uh, senior uh, technical specialist with the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, GAIN, uh, from Dr. Monjour uh, Morshed Ahmed, uh, member of the Bangladesh Food Safety Network, uh, Dr. Augustin Okurawa, uh, Okurawa, sorry, head of the Eat Safe Country Program at GAIN Nigeria. Uh, we'll have also with us Professor William Chen, the director of the Food uh, Science and Technology uh, Program of Singapore Nanyang Technological University. Uh, we'll then have Mr. Dirk Schulz, the Food Safety Officer from FAO, who will be facilitating a panel uh, reflecting on the case uh, studies presented and actions to bring food safety and nutrition together through uh, an agri-food system approach with Dr. Stella North Hagen, Mr. Jose Valls Bodo, uh, policy officer at the FAO Food Systems and Food Safety Division, and Dr. Luz uh, Maria de Regil, uh, head of the multi-sectoral action in food systems unit at WHO. Thank you all, of course, for agreeing to be uh, with us today in what promises to be a very rich uh, conversation. Dear participants, the, the purpose of these webinars is to enable us to collectively learn from the process of taking action in the field about how to leverage the power of agri-food systems to improve nutrition while also achieving other development goals. So before we start, we would like to share with you the lessons we learned from our webinar last month which uh, brought a wide range of speakers together to discuss urban food systems for better diets. Uh, to do so, I will give the floor to uh, Professor Corinna Oakes, who is a senior consultant uh, in the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, and who is also the director of the Center for Food Policy at City University of London, uh, uh, will uh, brief us on the lessons from our last dialogue. So, Corina, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dominique. Can I just check you can hear me okay? Yes, very well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Excellencies and, and colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here today. And as uh, Dominique said, 
the last webinar was around urban food systems and we learned a lot of interesting lessons from the discussants and the panelists at that uh, at that session and there is a, so much activity going on around the world to improve urban food systems we heard from three specific examples Pemba in Mozambique, Pune in India, and Nairobi in Kenya. And what emerged very clearly from all three examples was just how important formative research and assessment processes had been in identifying where action was most needed in those cities and could be most effective. In short, knowing their food system in these cities was the starting point for systems change enabling them to focus on solutions such as improving market infrastructure, reducing food waste and designing more effective dietary interventions that were really going to be effective in their context. A second lesson concerned multi-stakeholder platforms, which proved key to successful working in those cities. Primary and secondary cities have, pro have proven an ideal level to establish these multi-stakeholder platforms bringing together actors from across food systems co to coordinate and make decisions and building trust and creating a shared agenda across the food system proved crucial to the success of these platforms. So first it was about knowing their own food systems. Secondly, it was about bringing together multi-stakeholder platforms with actors across food systems. And another driver of success was participating in external networks, global, regional and national and city to city to enable cities to learn from each other, to exchange ideas and, uh, and, and cooperating with these, these networks really was shown to have a tangible impact on the ability to have um, effect change across food systems. Finally, there was, was a real challenge that emerged um, from these cities from a nutrition perspective that if they are going to really effectively improve nutrition, there is a need to connect agendas across different systems more effectively, such as ensuring food waste reduction also works to enhance access to nutritious foods. And the solution to that was seen as identifying co-benefits between different agendas and intentionally focusing and leveraging these co-benefits. So they were the main lessons that we learned. Uh, they also, they, they're very uncommon with the lessons that we learned from the previous webinar. So already from these dialogues, some common lessons are beginning to emerge. And with that, I'll pass back to Dominique. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corinna. And indeed, uh, we see indeed uh, common lessons that start to emerge. And this is why we have a uh, we have a commitment to start each of these dialogues with a sort of uh, lessons learning from the previous one. And we will we are currently discussing how to have towards the end of the year, perhaps early next year, uh, a broader stock taking exercise to, to, to indeed jointly identify all these, uh, these, uh, the, these common aspects and, and lessons learned uh, to share with you and therefore contribute to the, to the broader discussion collectively, of course. Uh, but again, thank you, Corinna, and uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates and participants. Uh, before moving on to our distinguished speakers, I would like to briefly introduce today's topic um, um, of the of the dialogue. On, uh, of course, um, and what I should say is that it is well established that food safety and nutrition are linked. Uh, unfortunately. Though it is also evident that there is insufficient recognition of this in the management of both food safety and nutrition, leading to therefore missed opportunities for, for synergy. Uh, an agri-food system approach presents the opportunity uh, for that synergy since uh, changes can be made in agri-food systems to support both food safety and nutrition. This dialogue aims to spark ideas on how to do that, uh, drawing lessons from uh, diverse examples from three countries working to advance uh, food safety. And the examples that we are going to listen to today are from Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Singapore. Uh, before hearing from representatives from these three countries, we'll now start with some experts to provide some background and context. And we'll first hear from Dr. Eleonora Dupuy, 
uh, food safety officer at FAO will highlight food systems thinking on food safety and nutrition and FAO's approach to food safety. Then we'll have Dr. Stella Nordhagen, uh, senior technical specialist with GAIN, who will present on the link between links between currently siloed communities of practice of food safety and nutrition. So, uh, uh, Eleonora, uh, the, the floor is yours to start with. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Dominique, for the floor and for the introduction for uh, this uh, dialogue. And I will start now uh, sharing my, um, uh, my screen. Um, please let me know if uh, you see uh, the presentation. Yes, perfect like that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you today and contribute from a food safety perspective to setting the scene for the discussion on how to bring food safety and nutrition together through an agri-food system approach. Food safety and nutrition quality are essential elements and integral part of food security concept. Food security and food safety are interlinked fundamentals for healthy diets and improved nutrition. There is no food security without food safety. What is not safe is not food. And without food safety, there are no healthy diets. Foodborne diseases exacerbate nutrient deficiencies and contribute to malnutrition, morbidity, and mortality. The essential interdependencies between food security, food safety, and healthy diets need to be recognized and considered in policy making, programming, investments, and action. So, how to achieve food safety? Food safety is an assurance that food will not cause adverse health effects to the consumer when it is prepared and or eaten according to its intended use. Food safety refers to compliance with standards and application of good practices in agri-food systems, aiming to avoid, minimize, or reduce food safety risks till acceptable levels. Food safety is vulnerable. It requires continuous surveillance changes in the environment, in climate, changes in global drivers and agri-food systems may have potential to disrupt and potential to strengthen food safety. Ensuring food safety need to be considered at all stages of food supply chain from farm to table and across all agri-food systems. Food safety is important for all three dimensions of uh, sustainability. This slide brings uh, some statistics in this regard. For people, food safety is vital for life and health. It has a role as well for leveling inequalities. Food safety is important for economies. Being essential for trade, market access, is an enabler for income, livelihoods, economic growth, and development. Food safety is a well, is a well a contributor to climate change mitigation. Produced food and agri-food practices are entry points to reduce the environmental footprint. Food safety is key to building greater efficiency, inclusiveness, sustainability, and resilience into agri-food systems. Yet, food safety is often overseen or given little attention in food security and nutrition policies. At the request of the FAO Committee on Agriculture, the FAO Strategic Priorities for Food Safety for 2022-2031, with a vision to provide safe food for all people at all times, have been developed to contribute to the 2030 Agenda. These priorities have been endorsed last week by the FAO Committee on Agriculture at its 28th session. The FAO strategic priorities for food safety focus on four major strategic areas, including food safety governance, sound scientific advice and evidence, strengthening national food control system, and promoting public-private collaboration 
to ensure food safety risk management and controls throughout agri-food systems. There is no uh, hierarchy or ranking uh, among these priorities. All are essential and interdependent. The in endorsed FAO strategic priorities for food safety will support the implementation of the FAO strategic framework 2022-2031, directly contributing to the SDG 1, zero poverty, SDG 2, zero hunger, SDG 3, good health and well-being, and supporting a number of other SDGs like uh, number 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, and 17. The priorities provide strong synergies and are instrumental for many FAO priority program areas, including healthy diets for all. They will support repositioning food safety within agri-food system transformation as an opportunity to increase awareness of food safety role and benefits, to increase political commitment, prioritization, investments, mainstreaming, and consistent integration into agri-food systems. Food safety is multi-sectoral and everyone's business. It can be achieved only through intersectoral policy alignment among agriculture, health, environment, trade, education, social protection, finance. Connecting agenda across systems toward a common goal through cooperation, coordination, data sharing, capacity development, concerted and impactful action. Identifying co-benefits and leveraging synergies are key for success. Strengthening food safety, reducing food losses by unsafe criteria, promoting the production of foods that are both nutritious and safe, that make up accessible and affordable healthy diets, are part of the solution to improve food security and nutrition worldwide. I would like to thank all for the attention and wish you all insightful deliberation within this event. And now I will give uh, the floor back to Dominique. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Eleonora, for, for such a, a clear presentation on, on the interconnection uh, between food safety, food security, and uh, healthy diets, but also how to achieve food, food safety and the importance of food safety in the three dimensions of sustainability and then coming to the, the FAO roles in support of that. So that's very clear, thank you. And now let's move to uh, indeed uh, Dr. Nord, Nord Hagen uh, on the, 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 the links between uh, these uh, communities. So uh, Stella, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Dominic. And thanks, everybody, for, um, for joining us today, whether you're joining from here in Geneva or from, from further afield. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm still waiting for my, my slides to come up, but I'll begin talking um, in, in the interim and hope, hope they'll come up, uh, come up soon. But I, I imagine that some people attending may have been a little surprised to see a session on food safety appearing in the lineup of this nutrition dialogue series. And indeed, the two topics of nutrition and food safety are often treated separately with different sets of research, interventions, experts, policies, and technical bodies. But as Eleonora pointed out, both are essential aspects of food security. And there are three reasons I see why action to improve nutrition will be more efficient and effective if it also considers food safety. Next slide, please. The first is that nutrition and food safety have large and closely overlapping burdens. Malnutrition in one of its forms affects over one third of the global population, and there are about 600 million cases of foodborne disease annually. Both of these come with large economic costs from 110 billion, as Eleonora cited, up to 3 trillion US dollars per year. And for both, the burden falls heaviest on low and middle income countries. And within those countries on vulnerable groups like young children, lower income people, and those who don't have good access to water, sanitation, and other types of infrastructure. In addition, the greatest known food safety risks are associated with some of the most nutrient dense foods. So things like animal source foods, like uh, dairy, fish, and meat, as well as fresh vegetables and fruits. 
So addressing these two large causes of ill health involves engaging with similar populations as well as with similar foods. Next slide. Second, food safety and nutrition are closely and bi-directionally interlinked. Foodborne disease influences malnutrition and malnutrition influences foodborne disease. And these linkages can be grouped into four areas, health and physiology, consumer behavior, supply chains and markets, and policy and regulations. The linkages are perhaps the, the clearest when it comes to health and physiology, as foodborne disease can cause reduced nutrient intake and absorption, which can increase the risk of malnutrition. And at the same time, those people who are already malnourished are more susceptible to disease, including foodborne disease. But there are also linkages when it comes to the behavior of consumers and of market actors. For example, concern over food being unsafe can lead to food vendors choosing not to sell certain foods. For example, avoiding those that they see as having a, a large level of risk, like perhaps dairy products, and instead to sell other foods, which can impact food availability in the market and therefore have an, an impact on people's choices and their diets. It can also lead to consumers changing their dietary choices directly, which can impact their nutrition. For example, research in low and middle income countries has shown that some consumers choose to eat highly processed packaged foods because they perceive them as being safer because they're processed in an industrial manner and they're packaged in a way that seems to protect the food in the market. But these highly processed foods can have a negative impact on their nutrition. Finally, there are also some linkages related to policies and regulations. For example, the creation of right fit food safety standards that make it feasible for producers and vendors to comply can encourage the production and sale of highly nutritious foods. Whereas having very strict standards that are, are seen as infeasible can act as a disincentive to supplying the same types of foods. So food safety and nutrition are closely interlinked and intervening to affect one can also affect the other. Next slide. So that brings me to the, the third reason why nutrition actions need to consider food safety. And this is that in some cases, more efficient and effective programs and policies could be achieved by tackling the two jointly by taking a food systems perspective, such as was described in Eleonora's remarks, and I hope will be clear in the examples that we'll hear about later in this dialogue. Next slide. Indeed, the, the links between food safety and nutrition, they're already recognized in some important international documents, such as shown in the, in the quotes here, and really enshrined within that definition of food security. But as Dominique mentioned at the beginning, these linkages are often not actually embodied in practice. For example, many of the major frameworks out there for nutrition and for food systems, which are used to guide programming, policies, and monitoring and evaluation, don't mention food safety, or they mention food safety in passing, but without actually integrating it in any detail into the recommendations they make or the implications that they draw. Similarly, many different food safety frameworks and policies don't mention nutrition. And in practice, we see that these two issues, food safety and nutrition, are rarely addressed in a comprehensive manner through integrated policies and programs. However, more integrated approaches represent untapped potential for improving nutrition and health. And I look forward to hearing more about approaches like that in today's dialogue. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. North Hagen, uh, to indeed illustrate so well the link between food safety and nutrition as the issue, and therefore the, the importance for these uh, these communities uh, to to closely interact uh, um, to within with each other of course uh, highlighting that intervening on one aspect can impact the other one and therefore why it is so important to that food safety uh, be considered uh, in the context of our nutrition effort and therefore in the context of this nutrition theory so thank you again to both uh, you and uh, Eleonora. And uh, we'll now hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Munzur Morshet Ahmed, uh, who is a member of the Bangladesh Food Safety Network, 
uh, we share with us the experience of transforming <coughs> in Bangladesh uh, through a food system approach. Uh, Dr. Munzur, very happy to see you and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dominic. I hope you hear me. Yes, very, very well. Please go uh, ahead. Uh, excellences, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. thank you for having me and uh, greetings from Bangladesh Food Safety Authority. Uh, good evening from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, let me a few seconds, I can share my slides. So I think uh, uh, you, you see my slides. Yes, perfect, perfect. Please yeah, thank, uh, thank you. Just I will uh, uh, give my stories of uh, food safety in Bangladesh, you know, uh, the strategies and interventions and governance issues. So first of all, Bangladesh Food Safety Authority, it is a new organization in Bangladesh. Uh, the overall Food Safety Act has promulgated in 2013. You know, before that, uh, there is an ordinance, pure food ordinance in 1959, the days back old ordinance and uh, Bangladesh food safety was based on that ordinance. But uh, due to modern uh, concepts and uh, requirements, uh, the government has enacted Food Safety Act 2013. And uh, under this act, uh, Bangladesh Food Safety Authority uh, established in 2015. So that it's only a four, uh, only a six years uh, old organizations. But this organization is very powerful in terms of mandates and uh, some other aspects. I'll give you these stories. So uh, uh, what is uh, uh, now observing here today, the Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina uh, has enacted this Food Safety Act 2013 and uh, Food Safety Authority has established, but the most important aspect is by establishing these authorities, I believe the transformation of science-based food safety in Bangladesh has started uh, with this uh, authority. So the organization is uh, dealing the overarching organization uh, for having the overall coordination of uh, food safety among the uh, you know uh, other organizations responsible for uh, uh, different kind of uh, activities of uh, food safety. So this is uh, one kind of big achievement in Bangladesh, I would say. So, you know, in Bangladesh constitutional uh, constitution, it is mentioned in article 15 and 18 that uh, uh, the every people or every citizen has right uh, to have uh, safe and uh, nutritious food. Uh, it, this is written in our uh, constitution, and uh, all of you know that uh, if food is not safe, that, that is not food actually. So uh, uh, for having that right, food safety is considered as a prerequisite to achieve overall food security in Bangladesh. And uh, already the top priority of the present government actually, uh, this government has a party election agenda to ensure a safe food for all people and uh, the country is looking for the um, great achievements of SDGs by 2030 uh, by ensuring the safe food or uh, placing it in the top of the agenda. Also, we have in Bangladesh the uh, eight five-year plan and in the eight five-year plan, uh, food safety and uh, nutritious food, uh, this is all our top priority in the agenda of the eight five-year plan. And also we have a vision 2041 where we can see that all people of Bangladesh are having access for nutrition and safe food. And so this is a big achievement. So uh, if you consider the food system priority pathway in Bangladesh, uh, so I would say that uh, there are uh, some, some big pillars uh, for having the uh, you know, food system. First of all, we, we have a vision that we should have a zero hunger for all our people. And uh, for uh, having the zero hangar, uh, you should uh, be able to access safe and sustainable uh, uh, sustainable food system 
if the sustainable food system is not in place, uh, zero hunger is not possible. And we also want to reduce the malnutrition in our country. So malnutrition redu reduction is one of the important uh, aspect as well of the food system in Bangladesh. Resilient food system is also important. You know, the climate change, the vulnerability, all the resilient, all the all the natural calamities that is very prone in Bangladesh. We have a sudden flood, flash floods, some other natural calamities, but we need a resilient food system uh, for having the um, uh, you know safe and accessible food for all people. And Bangladesh is based on agricultural livelihoods, so it is also very uh, important for our food system as well. Safe and nutrition food. I also mentioned that safe and nutrition food is the pillar of uh, our food system. Also, we focuses on food loss and waste. Because in Bangladesh, uh, if you consider the you know, food security, that you would say that around 18 to 20 percent of produced food are actually, uh, you know, post harvest loss. So this very big amount of uh, post harvest loss and waste is a very important concern uh, for uh, a, a resilient and sustainable food safety, uh, sorry, resilient food system. Uh, in Bangladesh. So this is one of the important issues we have to consider it. And uh, lastly, the one health approach, you know, uh, is another concept that uh, Bangladesh is currently uh, pursuing. Mm -hmm. uh, if we see that uh, the strategies for food and nutrition security, uh, there are actually, you know, we have a food policy monitoring unit. Uh, this uh, food policy monitoring unit under the Ministry of Food is dealing basically uh, the food policies and food related other issues. This uh, food policy monitoring uh, committee, there is a um, uh, top committee that uh, is responsible for strategic orientation of that related uh, issues. And we have national committees, that national committee has uh, overall guidance and the liaison activities and food policy uh, working group is uh, actually um, coordinates the uh, technical teams. Those are actually working in the field and uh, responsible for monitoring. So overall the uh, strategies for food and nutrition security is observing in this uh, uh, way. So, uh, uh, you know that food safety, what uh, is started in 2013 uh, with a new act, a modern act. If you consider this act or overall the coordination of food safety authority in Bangladesh, we see that uh, the safe and diverse and exotic agro produce we have, we have a lot of uh, agricultural produce. Uh, we have to make that agriculture produce safe and um, uh, nutritious for all the people. And for having that, we need a food safety management system in food supply chain. Uh, actually, Food Safety Act 2013 provides uh, this modern food safety management system in Bangladesh. So we are currently uh, practicing that food safety management system, modern food safety management system under the you know, purview of this Food Safety Act 2013. So this is another another important thing so we can uh, can say. Uh, if you consider the science based risk based science based and risk based food safety management system also started uh, uh, under that uh, food safety act. So now we uh, we we manage we try to manage the food safety in Bangladesh or uh, to ensure the food security and nutrition in Bangladesh, having uh, science based evidence based uh, policies and uh, risk based approach so that we can do right things uh, and for right time. And now, if you consider the uh, the approach of food safety in Bangladesh, you will I would say that uh, this this is this is a time that we are. Uh, shifting the paradigm from a reactive to proactive approach. That means uh, basically previously in Bangladesh, uh, we are doing uh, food controls by a reactive approach. That means uh, the end product inspection and the event-based um, you know, activities, but uh, under this Food Safety Act, now we are shifting uh, from reactive to proactive, that means the preventive approach of uh, food safety, so that the uh, the, the non-compliances in the production level and uh, the self uh, uh, you know compliance systems can be adapted, so that uh, your uh, food will uh, in the supply chain will be more safe, and you will need more 
uh, less effort to control in the end product system. So uh, these are actually the basic elements uh, and basic uh, approach that uh, we are trying to, to manage in food safety uh, system in Bangladesh. And uh, if I consider that uh, even based or uh, safety of uh, agricultural crops or agro producers, what are the aspects we can consider? Uh, presently, that you see that uh, accredited testing of laboratory is a challenge in Bangladesh. We do not have that much uh, very uh, high uh, level accredited testing laboratories so that uh, we can uh, compliance every food for export or uh, domestic purpose. Also, uh, uh, we are trying to to maintain the uh, coordinated monitoring systems through the organizations like the Department of Agricultural Extension or uh, Department of uh, Plant Quarantine and other uh, agro-produce related organizations. So we have a responsibility uh, to coordinate uh, those organizations so that uh, the good agricultural practice uh, or uh, uh, good, uh, you know, producing practice and post harvest loss can be addressed. Uh, so this is uh, the way we are doing currently. Actually, uh, central uh, packing system or packaging improvement is another another uh, you know aspects that is also responsible for the loss of nutrition and uh, the risk of food safety in the agro producers. As I mentioned. Uh, almost 18 to 20 percent of foods are wasted uh, in the post-harvest uh, uh, phase. Uh, these are basically uh, mostly uh, due to uh, inappropriate, uh, you know, packagings and uh, preservation systems not in place. So um, this is uh, very, very concern about that. And also, if you don't have the good agricultural practice and certification system. Uh, basically, uh, the export will be um, will be declined, and the export will be not uh, boosting in that situation. And uh, traceability system is also responsible for uh, that that kind of management in food safety. Doctor Doctor Manzu, I would yes, just yeah. like to clarify that you have five more minutes, please. Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll finish uh, shortly. If Thank you consider, you, yeah, if you consider that aquatic origin of foods, I cannot uh, say that uh, all these aquatic origins we are focusing for good aquatic practice, uh, national residue control plans, and all kinds of uh, compliance is necessary for the Bangladesh system. So the safety of meat and poultry is same. Food safety management coordination with Bangladesh Food Safety Authority is a central position, and we are coordinating all these, uh, you know. Uh, the primary productions liberated organization so that we can do better food safety management in Bangladesh for the primary productions like the meat and uh, safety uh, products. And also, if you consider the overall management, the mool focus, main focus is the for primary production is good agriculture practice, livestock practice, aquaculture practice, and for manufacturing and distributions, good manufacturing uh, practice, hygiene practice, as well and ISO or other certification systems. So what is actually the Food Safety Authority is doing uh, is the priority for uh, multi-agency coordination is important, address the gaps and lapses food control system, risk-based inspection, and shifting from end product inspection to preventive approach. So uh, in this slide, you can see the BFSC is coordinating with uh, more than 18 ministries and some 35 uh, divisions. The, so focus is to have a better coordination for better food safety management. And uh, uh, lastly, I can see the um, what I should, sorry for delay. Uh, we are doing uh, some of the important activities like uh, uh, public awareness and media uh, activities, uh, television clips, trilogy and play, leaflets for posters for public awareness and caravan shows and other things for, uh, you know, uh, the things. And monitoring and awareness, we are doing a lot of activities. We have the monitoring and uh, some gradings and hotel activities and other aspects as well. So after that, uh, this is the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can see some pictures. These are actually the lovely uh, and longest sandy bees in Cox's Bazaar. Thank you very much for hearing me.
Thank you. So this is over to Dominic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Monzo, for, for such a great presentation. And I must say, I was able, when I was a fair representative in your country, to testify all the efforts that have been done uh, to, to really uh, put uh, uh, food safety at the fore and, uh, and really the, to highlight also the, the, the political will. Political will, again, to my mind, is a key element. Uh, to, to really uh, lead to the adoption of the Food Safety Act and the creation of the Bangladesh Food Safety uh, Authority, um, recognizing that uh, without food safety, you cannot achieve uh, food, uh, food security. Um, what is, I think, also very striking in your presentation is the, the, the shift from, indeed, as you said, a, a reactive approach uh, to uh, a proactive uh, approach and of course all the efforts it takes and the interaction the multi-sectoral dimension of the effort you are uh, coordinating in collaboration with so many ministries so again uh, donovat thank you so much for this uh, this presentation and uh, it is now my my pleasure to to give the floor uh, to professor william shen uh, the director of the Food Science and Technology Program at the Singapore's Nanyang Technological University will speak about food safety considerations for accelerating the transition to sustainable, healthy, and inclusive uh, food uh, system. Professor Chen, the floor is yours. Let me see. Oh, sorry, I need to... Um, to use the slideshow, right? Yes, mm. yes, yes. Uh, I try to find this one. Yes, this one, please. Can you see me? Can you perfect, see the slide? Perfect, please go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to share our experience in Singapore. Um, you may ask, uh, what has Singapore got to do with uh, food security? Uh, being a small city state in the Southeast Asia. Well, um, food security is very much on our mind. Uh, we have been pushing uh, different measures to uh, develop tech-driven urban farming uh, practices in the city state. The idea here is not very much to ensure the self-reliance uh, of the uh, food supply in Singapore, but rather to provide a uh, developer buffer uh, to sort of absorb the shocks of uh, any food supply uh, chain disruptions. As we can see, this is uh, increasingly getting commonplace. So uh, in addition to Monsieur uh, Bujon's uh, description, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I'm also running two um, national food initiatives in Singapore. One is I'm the scientific director for Singapore Future Ready Food Safety Hub. And the second one is that I'm the director for Singapore um, Agri-Food Innovation Lab. Uh, so I, I sort of, uh, by being involved in this national food initiative, I sort of have uh, uh, some, some good perspective on what be, is being done and what needs to be done. Uh, so if I may move to the next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, Singapore is a very small city state. Uh, we have uh, the 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 areas uh, areas um, area size of Singapore is only seven hundred uh, kilometer square. Uh, it's about fifty kilometer times thirty kilometers. So if we uh, drive a car, uh, we have to break early because after if not after an hour we may end up in the sea. So it's very small and. And on top of that, we only have uh, less than 1% of the land for farming. Uh, why is this so? If you look at this slide, it shows the uh, challenges facing Singapore food security. On, on this uh, uh, left-hand side, what you see is actually a shrinking farmland over the years since uh, mid-60s when we gained independence. Uh, the green area indicates the farmland air, uh, space uh, in the, at the time of independence, and uh, with a push for industrialization and urbanization towards uh, a higher value economy, we let go the farmland and the trade-off is actually to import food from many countries. 
uh, right now, so much so that uh, uh, with a strong economic growth, now we have less than one percent of farmland, as you show uh, as shown here at the bottom, and uh, uh, we import more than ninety percent of food from one hundred sixty or seventy countries. Uh, so, in peacetime, there's no problem. Um, you can we can get we can secure food supply over the from over the place, but as uh, um, a lot of external factors are actually getting very fluid, as we can see in the um, climate change, the heat wave that is hitting the whole world now, and then the war in the Ukraine, and the COVID-19 pandemic. All these have uh, actually are showing that the food supply chain is actually very fragile. Uh, so there's a need to develop uh, urban farming um, uh, practice in the small state, uh, uh, city state in Singapore. Uh, how do we do with so little land? Well, one way is to develop vertical farming, uh, indoor farming, and then uh, also agriculture. The second challenge, the second challenge facing Singapore food security is the food waste, as the a uh, few speakers I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is uh, uh, actually a global problem. Uh, I always. Uh, um, put a comparison between the food waste and the food supply in the sense that it's like a kitchen water tap. If we're on the tap, we don't use the water. No amount of water is enough. Likewise, for food, if we do not maximize the food utilization, then no amount of primary production will be sufficient to uh, meet the demand of the world, in, in particular with the growing world population. The third one is actually the aging population. Uh, for those who have been to Singapore, you will see that uh, we are, uh, it's a very fast paced place. Um, people work very hard and uh, uh, not many children are, are, are being produced. So as a result, it's a fast aging population. The, the key here is that the nutrition requirement for the aging population is very different from the young and dynamic society. So if we produce food that is not appreciated or appre uh, accepted by the elderly, then we are also contributing to food waste. So when we look at these three elements, so there's a, a very strong need to develop an efficient food system uh, with urban farming as a starting point in Singapore, because this is a way we can transfer technology skill set into the farming practice. And, and so this is uh, uh, what we are showing here, sorry. Um, what we are showing here is that uh, we develop, when we develop an urban farming system uh, to try to create an efficient uh, production system, uh, there's also a, a sort of a, a natural uh, initiative to move towards a circular economy, meaning that whatever we produce, whatever we have utilized as a food, a food we'll try to reconnect back to the food chain. So. Um, Initially, when we look at the, all these innovations, as we show here, uh, um, natural food preservative through precision fermentation, uh, food uh, uh, nutrient recovery from processing side stream like uh, soybean residue, or converting the remaining residue into packaging material, all these are uh, part and parcel of the food circular economy. But uh, they are a concern about this. Um, I would I'd like to show you some examples of what I, we have been doing. Uh, for example, in terms of, uh, I, would, I would skip this one. This is a talent development of uh, to, to sort of sustain the future food security uh, push in Singapore. So we have partner with the GFI to, to educate a young mind to move into the food sector. Uh, at the bottom one shows a three example of uh, um, sort of uh, uh, alternative food uh, that are either produced in Singapore or uh, being approved in Singapore. As uh, you, may, you may have read, Singapore is the first country in the world to approve the cultivated chicken meat to, uh, to commercial production for consumer uh, use. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, some of the nutrient recovered from the uh, processing side stream have been reconnect back to the um, a food chain. In this case, we have used uh, this uh, fermented uh, barley span green from the brewery or from making a nutritional beverage. Uh, uh, after the fermentation, we extract the protein component we, and then we use it as an emulsifier to replace the egg yolk in the mayonnaise. 
So this this uh, sort of uh, plant based uh, uh, mayonnaise that we have created in Singapore. Uh, alongside, we have also um, sort of uh, look for replacement ingredient for the cultivated meat culture medium. This is a costly uh, component for the cultivated meat the industry. So this is another example of how we are uh, applying innovation to create uh, efficient and uh, low cost uh, uh, urban farming practice for the alternative uh, uh, food. So the question here is that, uh, are, they, yeah. are they also Sir, good? You, right? you could take two, three more minutes to continue. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, the area for consideration is that when we create this food circular economy, are we also circulating the food safety hazard? One example is actually the the mycotoxin that is actually present on the outside surface of this uh, uh, side stream. For example, barley or soybean residue. Another concern maybe is that, that when we look for this replacement ingredient for the medium of cultivated meat, are uh, this all safe? And uh, there's also a tendency to apply this uh, insect farming, let the insect feed the insect with all the food waste, and then let the insect be the uh, fish feed. Also, but the, the concern here is that the, in the food waste, you also have a lot of heavy metal and plastic waste uh, that they associated with the food waste. Uh, so these are some of the examples which highlight the need that uh, when we push for urban farming towards higher yield and higher nutrition, we have also we, we also need to take consideration of a higher safety assessment. Uh, this is my last slide. So the way forward is that we can see that the higher nutrition has to be uh, uh, assessed together with uh, higher safety. So these, these two are interconnected. And the urban farming production will not replace traditional farming, but it provides a, a, a new option for future food system. And the, uh, among these urban farming pr uh, practice, you have alternative food sources. And the uh, uh, food circular economy uh, can be an efficient part of the efficient food system, but the food safety need to be part of this assessment. So the way forward is to develop a proactive approach to ensure the safety of high nutrition food on the future food system. And for future food, we clearly need to associate tech innovation with the safety assessment. This is my last slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much uh, indeed, uh, Professor, Professor Chen, for your, your presentation, for presenting the very particular context of Singapore. Why? Food security indeed is so important, uh, and then and then indeed uh, presenting the the work you do on food circular economy, the alternative food, uh, coming to the point of urban food production, presenting the the importance of the the proactive approach uh, to indeed diversify that sort of production through innovation, etc. But then I, I very much appreciated the slide you had on the on the questions uh, that need to be uh, considered while working uh, on these uh, on these elements. And this reminded me a very important uh, publication of uh, FAO, which I don't know if you can see, but it's about thinking about the future of food safety, a foresight report. Which is really I have read that. I have read that. Yeah. Yep. And uh, which uh, indeed need to be uh, to be uh, uh, considered. Uh, and just let me do that to show you to show everybody that report and we'll share the link. Diana can probably uh, share the link. Thank you so much indeed again, um, Professor uh, Chen, for your your presentation. And Thank I would you. like now to. Uh, to move uh, to uh, Dr. Augustine Okorua, the head of Eat Safe uh, uh, Country Program at Gain Nigeria, will speak about addressing food safety in traditional markets uh, to benefit consumer diets and nutrition, and uh, the case of uh, Eat Safe in uh, Nigeria. So, Dr. Okorua, the floor is yours, and apologies again for messing up a bit the, the, the sequence of speakers, but very happy to have you now. Over to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, from Nigeria. Yeah, we can hear you. Please go ahead. But your, sli your slideshow seems to be moving. OK. Okay. So I, with this, uh, 
talking about addressing food safety in traditional markets to improve nutrition, uh, the Eat Safe Experience in Nigeria, the program. This is a, a feed feature USAID funded project, and it is evidence and action towards safe, nutritious food. The traditional market um, is a reference point for food safety challenges in Nigeria. But as we look at Nigeria as a country, and globally, consuming unsafe food can result in food on disease, which we know. Then in Nigeria, annually, food borne disease is responsible for about 173 million diarrhea disease cases. And out of that, 33,000 deaths. And in Nigeria, food borne disease related to food safety uh, issues are over 200 deaths. And that's a cause for concern. Then the focus of the Eat Safe program is on traditional food markets in Nigeria, but we also are working in Ethiopia, but this will focus in on Nigeria. So in Nigeria, millions of uh, Nigerians buy food from traditional markets. And at this traditional market, supply and demand intersect. And that is where the interconnection of food safety and uh, nutrition becomes very evident. As it as as concerns the vendors and the consumers, livelihoods for the vendors, uh, community building for communal living, food safety issues coming, and then food security as an integral part of national planning and economic development, and also for community level food security. And Regulations, food safety regulations, often focus only on former food sectors, overlooking informal shops and traditional markets, where majority of, of households in Nigeria purchase their food, and thereby also increasing uh, foodborne disease risk if there is no regulation of this sector properly by the local uh, municipal or local government authorities. Our uh, it's safe approach. We're, we're working in two states in Nigeria, Sokoto and Kirby states. We are currently focused on enabling lasting improvements in the safety of uh, nutritious food in traditional markets through four interventions, uh, the central market in Kebi and Dankuri market in Sokoto State. These four interventions have been designed through a human-centered design approach, taking into consideration all stakeholders and partners on the project, and these four, the food safety stand based on the findings from our formative research, awareness creation, more information is needed across the entire value chain and specifically for the consumers. So we are planning a food safety stand at both markets and we have uh, five food safety alcohol staff that will be trained on food safety to provide information to consumers and other market actors, all aspects of food safety. We also have a radio show. Radio, through our formative research analysis, shows that that has the widest reach in both Kirby State and the Sokoto State. And so a radio show will be done to provide information on food safety. And then we also have a brand initiative. After being trained, we expect behavioral change among the uh, vendors and others that have been trained. And that brand is to encourage vendors to practice what they have been taught about food safety in situ in the marketplace. In order to bring an alliance into motion, to be able to ensure that uh, food safety is considered a priority and commonly used as a means of reference to ensure that every consumer, every vendor, every value chain actor is concerned, we have formed an association for the promotion of food safety and improved nutrition. And this is bringing together all the stakeholders and activities will involve mobilization, sensitization, and trainings. What opportunities do we have as far as food safety is concerned and its impact on development economically and otherwise? So prioritizing food safety supports six SDGs, two, three, six, eleven, twelve, 12, and 17. And these are significant as SDGs. 
which ensures that if these components that have food safety are properly implemented, the overall objective is a strategic goal of the SDGs to be achieved in Nigeria in particular, because over 90% of Nigerians access fresh foods, nutritious food from traditional markets, making these settings a key focus area for impact if we want the SDGs to work. Therefore, coalitions, communities of practice, and commitments to food safety are emerging nationally and create an enabling environment for improving safety. Just yesterday, at the National Assembly, the Food Safety and Quality Bill had its public hearing, and uh, all stakeholders made their input and their submissions, and we are waiting for the outcome, whether it's going to progress or whether it's going to be stepped down for review. The key challenge is consumers in Nigeria express less satisfaction in government activities at ensuring food and water safety compared to global averages, the essence of the ESA project coming in as well. Consumers' risk perception of food safety does not always align with risk reality. That's the truth. Microbial pathogens are mostly responsible for the foodborne disease, but toxins and pesticides are top of mind for consumers. And this is a real issue in Nigeria. A real issue, pesticide and, uh, and toxins, mycotoxins and the rest. National legal and government structures often focus only on former food sectors, like I earlier said, overlooking street food stores, informal shops, and traditional markets, and that contains high risk. And the Nigerian Food Safety and Quality B had not been enacted into law. That B was first drafted in 2016. And up to today, like I said, it was just yesterday that the public hearing was done. What are the solutions that we might look at? We have to prioritize food safety as foundational pillar for nutrition. That is the intersection, that is the interface. Food security and development initiatives and efforts. We have to cultivate a culture of food safety consciously through multi-sectoral engagement as all have a role to play when it comes to food safety. It is everyone's business. We have to build on existing efforts in policy, health, and economic development to maximize collective impact. Food safety is actually a foundation for nutrition. Foodborne disease can affect nutrient intake and metabolism. This can impact a variety of human health outcomes and have long, lifelong effects. And when you now consider children's growth, nutrient assumption, gut illness, and other diseases, then food safety intersection with nutrition must be given the needed support and strategic funding for research and additional implementation of behavior change programs that will enable consumers, vendors, transporters, market authority, research and academia, consumer associations, to be concerned about food safety and be part of the solution by taking the necessary action since food safety is everyone's business. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Okowua, for, for presenting the, the work that you are doing in Nigeria. Uh, in the context of the Eat Safe uh, program, the, the challenges which you are facing, but then with a focus on the indeed the, the traditional markets, what I very much like is the uh, well, you are you are promoting this uh, the importance of prioritizing food safety, but you are con bringing a contribution through evidence. Uh, so it's about evidence building, uh, policy making, uh, evidence. No evidence-based, sorry, policy making by by having the, the the testing of different approaches, etc., which is indeed very good, and then promoting, of course, uh, the culture of uh, of food safety, uh, which is very important. So again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Okorua, for that, and uh, we now enter the, the 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 panel discussion segment of our webinar. And uh, our panelists today will reflect on the case studies presented and discuss actions uh, to bring food safety and nutrition together through an agri-food system approach. And I will now give the floor to my colleague, uh, Dirk, Dirk Schulz, who is a food safety officer at FAO, uh, will be uh, facilitating uh, the discussion. Uh, Dirk, uh, great to see you. And the floor is yours to moderate this uh, discussion. 
Thank you very much, Dominique. And um, welcome everybody to this uh, section on a, the panel discussion. In the interest of time, and we are about uh, 10 to 15 minutes behind our schedule, I will uh, skip my introductory remarks and move straight uh, away to introducing our panel members who will discuss actions to bring food safety and nutrition together through an agri-food systems approach. So first off, we have Dr. Stella Nordhagen, Senior Technical Specialist Gain, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, whom you've heard before already. Next up, we have Mr. Jose Valls Bordeaux, the Policy Officer at the FAO Food Systems and Food Safety Division. And last but not least, Dr. Luz Maria de Regel from our sister agency, the World Health Organization, where she is the head of the Multisectoral Action in Food Systems Unit. Welcome all. And as I said, our time is not on our side in this section, so I'm going to uh, straight away uh, start with a question for Luz. Luz, can you reflect on the implications of the Singapore case study, but the others as well, of course, with regards uh, to actions uh, that support food safety and sustainability? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Derek. Um, I, I first would like to express my gratitude for this invitation. Uh, two years ago, the Department of Nutrition uh, and food safety merged in WHO. And with that, I think that we are trying to build more synergies between these two areas to contribute to the global targets for nutrition, non-communicable diseases, and now the recently approved targets for food safety. So I'm delighted with this conversation and particularly with all the uh, country cases that have been shared. Um, I think that I would just like uh, to talk about four points for consideration. The first part is a uh, terminology. I think that uh, uh, there is no international harmonization for the terminology for many of these novel products that we have heard now. We hear cultivated meat, uh, also referred as sales-based meat, cultured meat, slaughter-free meat, etc. And terminology matters because uh, it may lead uh, to gaps in regulations and also to a lot of uh, confusion. So important to address that. I want to say that the Codex Alimentarius has already started work in this topic and is already circulating a letter seeking a input from member states and observers on the topic and issues like regulatory issues, labeling, nutrition, food safety aspects are considered within this letter of novel products. The second point that I want to make is about technology. It represents a huge potential uh, to produce um, these type of products in a more sustainable way. However, uh, new technology needs to be tested. New processes need to be tested. New ingredients need to be tested. Uh, are we talking about cultural media, growth factors, uh, residue levels, etc.? So from the food safety perspective, although we um, are creating more sustainable solutions, uh, still we have to walk the path and make sure that these products are safe, properly labeled, et cetera. And I just want to make a call because I think that it's very important to, in this process, governments need to work with academia, private sector, et cetera. And also, I mean, of course, as a UN agencies, a, we need to support throughout the process as much as possible because all this information is critical for regulators. The case of Singapore particularly, I think that is, 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 is amazing. It's very interesting because it's the first country to approve a, a cultivated meat for a commercialization. So we are learning from what uh, we just heard. And the Singapore Food Agency uh, just published guidance on the requirements for uh, the safety assessment of novel foods, um, including requirements on the information to be submitted for approval of all these type of products. And I would say that a very interesting case is that they are updating the, the publication because new discussions are coming. Uh, I think that it has been updated three times since it was published in, last, in 2019. So I think that it's important that we follow this case because it's a, it's a pioneer in this area, but also we are learning about terminology, about how to include a, the different evidence in this type of regulations. And the last part that I want to uh, make is about uh, integration with nutrition and the non-communicable disease agenda. Uh, well, the shift of uh, towards uh, products of non-animal sources is desirable from the sustainability point of view, and sometimes from the uh, prevention of non-communicable diseases. I want to highlight 
that uh, the products, the food products with these food proteins are not necessarily healthier. Uh, we can see in the market many products that are high uh, processed, highly processed, that are high in sugar, unhealthy fats, and sodium. So, for example, some vegan products uh, that you we currently fi uh, find uh, everywhere uh, do not meet the recommended profile for salt and saturated fats. And these ingredients currently are used to improve the sensory characteristics of these proteins, but from the nutritional point of view, they are not desirable uh, or not. Are, do not match the profile that we want to, to see. On the nutrition side, I want to just highlight that, that an emerging area that uh, food additives that are added as we evolved also need to be assessed not only from the food safety side, but also on the effects on nutrition and on some of the biomechanical precursors of non-communicable diseases. The current food, uh, many of the food safety uh, risk assessments do not include those outcomes at this point. So it's important it's important that we see this in a more comprehensive picture. And the last point, uh, because I know that we are short of time, I want to say that it's important that we quantify the effects of these uh, potential effects in the burden of disease. For example, uh, with contaminants or chemical contaminants or toxins like aflatoxins, uh, they have an important contribution to the non-communicable disease agenda with liver cancer, for example, and we need to quantify it better to be able to better advocate for the management and prevention of all these pieces. Because if we are promoting a, a safety throughout the supply chain, we need to ensure that, uh, I mean, short-term effects are taken into account, but also long-term effects uh, are quantified as part of the global burden of disease. I will stop here. Thank you so much, Luz. I think you made some excellent and very insightful remarks. And I think these are particularly um, pertinent for the transformation of modern, let's say, urban agri-food systems uh, that will be needed to meet the 2030 agenda and beyond as our populations grow, as farming areas shrink, and as modern technology brings uh, new ways of ensuring, hopefully, good nutrition amongst our people. So once again, thank you for those excellent remarks. And um, next, I would like to move on to Jose, um, who is, uh, as a policy officer, well-placed to, to respond perhaps to a question more on the policy side of things. Jose, from what you've heard today, what lessons do you think we can learn for food systems policy action to enhance the link between food safety and nutrition? Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk. And, uh, and yeah, I want also to, to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation. And I think this is a, a really exciting discussion. Uh, congratulations to the for the for the case studies as well uh, that are indeed bringing many lessons. As, as we heard, uh, both food safety and, and, and nutrition have a critical role to play in, in achieving the sustainable development goals. And we know that we are not in track in most of the of the SDGs that are uh, related to agri-food systems, uh, in, like targets on on the SDG two on hunger, on on food security, on nutrition, uh, but also on SDG three that uh, relate to more the the, the health uh, aspects and the foodborne diseases, non-communicable diseases, but also so many other SDGs. And what we what we are seeing is that. Uh, in order for the, for the food safety and nutrition to, to really play a positive role and have an impact uh, in achieving these different, uh, these different uh, uh, targets, uh, we will only do it if we, uh, um, if we uh, can identify the, the trade-offs between uh, these, uh, these, these different actions and these different outcomes. And uh, once we understand them, we can address them, we can limit the trade-offs, but we can also uh, leverage the synergies that, that, uh, that can be. And we've seen, we've heard a lot of examples and even uh, now uh, from, from Luz uh, just right now. So maybe one of the most important lessons that came across is uh, the need for a food system approach to, uh, multiple, to, to multiply the benefits and the co-benefits when uh, um, dealing with, with uh, both uh, food safety and, and nutrition issues. This means addressing the, 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 the different uh, aspects with a holistic perspective, to consider these trade-offs, to, to consider also the possible synergies, 
Uh, and in this case, we're talking about uh, the link between food safety and nutrition, but of course, food safety also has implications in climate change and vice versa, also uh, implications on, on the economy, so does nutrition, so they are all uh, interconnected, and we need to consider all the elements of the, of the systems together. So looking at the choices that are made uh, at production level, but also the choices that are made at consumption level, and looking at the different uh, interconnected outcomes of the agri-food systems as a whole, which are not only on health and nutrition, but also on economy, on livelihoods, environment, you name it. So how can you translate that into concrete action and, and starting at, at policy level? We heard today uh, indeed some, some very good examples of, of some of the key entry points that can enable and that can accelerate uh, the adoption of, of, of action. That one of them is the multi-stakeholder collaboration. Uh, and trying to, to, to break silos or at, at, at least make bridges uh, 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 between silos. Because, of course, addressing these trade-offs that are uh, uh, coming in uh, consistently, uh, and these tra there are trade-offs between competing objectives, uh, they are uh, related to different uh, actors, different sectors that have often different perceptions and different interests. Uh, different power also, so they require negotiation. They, they require not only uh, information sharing, but really sometimes negotiation and, and coordination. It includes multi-sectoral coordination mechanisms. And we saw the example of uh, Bangladesh, where the food safety agency is working together with the, with the other uh, ministries and, and agencies as part of a, of, a, of a whole system, because the decisions affect the whole system, be it in agriculture, in health, in trade, etc. So this uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration also means uh, ensuring the participation of all the relevant uh, actors, uh, from producers to consumers, sometimes also bringing them uh, closer among themselves through uh, improved uh, food environments. And we saw the, the very good example of Nigeria on the, on the traditional markets. Uh, another of the entry points is the data and evidence. We need metrics to assess uh, the implication of, of the actions in different outcomes, and we've been hearing it today as well. Uh, we need to identify those trade-offs, but also quantify those trade-offs, uh, the possible synergies between food safety and, and nutrition, and these to, to increase the understanding, but also to explore what are the appropriate and balanced solutions uh, that can be offered. Uh, without uh, data, without uh, uh, assessment, it's it's very difficult. The data and uh, also would uh, or the the appropriate metrics would allow to monitor the performance and the progress over time in in these uh, synergies. Another of the entry points that came across very very uh, importantly and uh, actually my uh, the previous speaker uh, talked also about it is the technological innovation. No? with the example from uh, Singapore. Uh, and actually, one of the entry points for, for more sustainable food systems uh, and, and an accelerator to leverage different synergies and sometimes also address uh, some of the trade-offs is technological innovation. But he said, we also need a, a, an holistic approach in identifying the appropriate types of innovation that are needed uh, in, in different contexts. No? So they have to really be adapted to the context. And this is a bit also what uh, Luth was, was, was um, referring to. Also, we need to ensure that uh, we manage the, the distribution of the impacts of, of this innovation across different stakeholders and thinking especially of the most disadvantaged. And the last uh, of the entry points, policy entry points that I would like to mention now is the, the, the need to coherent policies and investment that can talk to each other. And that's why also uh, assessment, but also coordination is, is so important. Today, for example, we have 117 countries that have presented a national pathway to transform their food systems. These uh, national pathways come as a result of uh, the UN Food System Summit process uh, of last year in 2021. Uh, and, uh, uh, the countries have been presenting their, their different uh, pathways. Out of these pathways, there are 45 of them, and they include actually Bangladesh and Nigeria, that have included in their national pathways the food quality and, and safety as one of the priority areas with specific actions and sometimes in 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 uh, um, in synergy with 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 uh, their nutrition more nutrition um, uh, targeted actions. 
uh, these actions in, in the pathways, uh, you can, there is a, a database where you can find all the pathways and you can look all these uh, aspects that we have been uh, mentioning today, improving data, uh, risk assessment mechanism, regulatory frameworks, food control system, uh, standards, uh, improving consumer information and uh, engagement of consumers. That is also a, a place where it intersects between food safety and, and nutrition, uh, human resource capacities, etc. Uh, all those are uh, included in these national pathways uh, for food system transformation and having them all together with the different uh, dimensions can help uh, 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 better addressing these this, uh, this trade-offs and, and really integrate, starting to integrate a lot of these of this aspects. Just to end, um, uh, highlight that, uh, that taking this sustainable food system approach and this uh, more integrated and, and coherent policy frameworks is really providing an opportunity to food safety and nutrition, for example, to get the attention that they deserved. And we know, and it was mentioned also at the beginning, that sometimes they are hidden uh, behind other interests or other priorities. Uh, but uh, this opportunity needs to be seized, uh, definitely. And uh, also, they can uh, help inspiring integrated action and integrated thinking, especially by national governments and, and stakeholders, towards more sustainability in all its dimensions taking into account all the different uh, issues at country level. So I would uh, leave it just also saying that a lot of these lessons actually resonate with the lessons that were presented at the beginning from the last and or previous uh, dialogue. So hopefully this is really contributing to, the, to this uh, body of, of, of lessons and, and knowledge that we're generating. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jose. And wow, that was certainly a lot of information there. I mean, I think um, the important ones like assessing troughs, coordination of stakeholders and, and, and the others, I think they put towards the complexity that exists in systems transformation and in the systems thinking in general. The approach is, is challenging, but it also has a lot of opportunities. So thanks again for that. And now we'll move on to our last um, panelist. Uh, we, we've already heard from Stella, so Stella, uh, what integrated actions can a country take to bring food safe nutrition together using an agri-food systems approach? And perhaps you might want to mention uh, your work with private sector. Over to you. Maybe if you can just keep it as short as possible, please, um, in the interest of time and, and the other uh, commenters we might uh, hear from. Over to you, Stella. Sure, no problem, Dirk. Um, great question. And indeed, we, we don't have much time, but luckily we've already heard many great examples of this in this webinar. So I would say three things. Um, first, focus on the right foods. In order to improve diet quality, it's necessary to focus on policies and programs that promote highly nutritious foods and that make those more affordable, more accessible, and more desirable. But as we've heard a few times today, those foods tend to have relatively higher food safety risks. So those policies and programs need to go hand in hand with ensuring safety throughout the supply chain as well as within the household. And I think Professor Chen um, gave a great example of doing this on the supply side from Singapore. And on the demand side, a kind of simple concrete example one could imagine would be a promotional campaign for vegetables that also included messaging on safe handling of them when preparing them in the home. Second, I would say in specifically thinking of low and middle income countries, it's important to focus on the traditional and informal sector as, as Augustine did in his remarks. Most lower income countries, um, so, sorry, most lower income consumers in these countries obtain their food from outlets like traditional open air markets and street vendors. And those outlets play an essential role in food security and nutrition but they also face specific challenges from a food safety standpoint, such as a lack of access to clean water. Sometimes policies will seek to replace those with modern retail in an effort to upgrade the, the food safety situation, but that can result in disenfranchisement of livelihoods, as well as um, lack of access to safe and nutritious foods for the most vulnerable consumers. So it's important to work with them, improve their food safety standards in feasible ways, and ensure that access to nutrition food is, um, is, is continued. A good example of this comes from the clean street food hubs that have been developed in India where a group of street food vendors are grouped together, they're trained, and they're certified to provide safe street foods so that people know where they can go to get foods that are both affordable and safe. 
And finally, I'd say that it's um, it's really important to understand the, the motivations and the incentives that are faced by those within the food system as it relates to both food safety and nutrition, and then to design people-centered approaches based on those. So when I was talking earlier, I mentioned how there's some research in lower-income countries showing that consumers might choose highly processed packaged foods because they perceive those as being safer. And that for them is a rational decision within that context based on what they know about food safety through other outlets. So telling them about how unhealthy it is to have these foods that are high in salt, sugar, and fat is unlikely to result in consumption changes unless that food safety barrier is addressed. So an example of an intervention that's trying to do that is some work that some of my, my colleagues are doing in Kenya, where they're trying to address increasing demand for vegetables in a context where people are really worried about excessive pesticide content in vegetables by creating a kind of brand that certifies things that are both nutritious and safe so that consumers who are looking for vegetables can identify those that don't have a high level of pesticides within them at the market. So. Great. Thank you, Stella, for those very concise remarks, but very pertinent, I must say. And in the interest of time, I'd just like to thank the panelists for excellent interventions. I think all three of you made some really, really great points. And without further ado, I'm handing back to uh, Dominique. Dominique, back to you, please. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dirk. But thank you also uh, to you to faci for facilitating the panel. But thanks a lot to uh, Luz. Uh, Stella and Jose for for sort of of reflecting on the the extremely good presentation that we had uh, today, and I think this is really what we want to promote in uh, in these dialogues is is really the this capacity to extract lessons from from examples from the field and documenting them uh, going forward again in this in this process. So uh, time has come to conclude, and uh, as, as we said, it has been again. Uh, a fascinating uh, discussion to hear about the the three uh, examples which we got and to consider the different elements that need to be in place uh, to bring together agri-food system, food safety and nutrition. Work is, uh, as was said, clearly needed to align the agendas and what we have heard today shows uh, both the opportunities and the challenges in doing so. Uh, I would urge uh, participants to take Eat and learn from this experience and invest in agri-food system approaches to make uh, to making changes in it. As for the previous dialogue, we will be extracting some uh, of the key take-home messages and preliminary conclusions from this discussion and propose them to you at the beginning of our next webinar. And we have, we hope to have you, uh, Dirk, uh, to be able to. Uh, to summarize uh, these uh, findings and recommendations. I would like to express, of course, my sincere gratitude to all the distinguished speakers from the various uh, parts of the world for their presentation, but also for the very active uh, engagement in the, in the Q&A session. Because while we were uh, reflecting in the panel where we were having the, the various case studies, there was a very rich dialogue that was taking place in the Q&A session. We'll make sure we report on that, and this is all included in the in the in the material that is uh, put uh, online. Uh, I should say also that today, even though we are in the mid of the summer here in, in Europe, we had over 100 participants, which is uh, also very encouraging. Uh, I would like to take uh, to also thank our, our Geneva partners, WHO, Gain and Sun, and to the colleagues, of course, in uh, the food and nutrition division, as well as the uh, food system and food safety division, as well as the uh, FAO office in Brussels and my own office here in Geneva uh, for organizing this webinar. Uh, last but not least, our gratitude goes, of course, to you, participants, for taking uh, your time and joining this third, uh, this fourth event of the FAO in Geneva uh, Nutrition Dialogue Series. I thank you all for your attendance, and uh, please do join us for our next webinar uh, in September on the topic of food-based diet dietary uh, guidelines, uh, which will be a, uh, promised to be again very interesting. So with that, a uh, good rest of the day, wherever you are in the world, and uh, looking forward to engage with you on this very, very important topic.
Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.